Um, I'm, I am going to go ahead and get started. It's one o'clock already. Uh, there's kind of some introductory stuff to, to get us going. Uh, enrollment has about 25 people so far. I see a lot of familiar faces, both from bioengineering and biomedical physics. There's also some electrical engineering students that are taking the course uh, this quarter as well, which uh, happens from time to time. Uh, the nice thing that we're, one of the reasons we chose this room for uh, this course, uh, A, is the comfortable seating. Uh, B, is the nice climate control system that we have in place. Uh, but probably more importantly is all the lectures will be recorded. Uh, we're going to kind of play around with exactly what we make available to you guys, but in principle, anything that's on the screen, including the audio, will be available to you guys as well. So hopefully that's a useful thing. Uh, if it's not useful, let me know, because uh, we have to pay to do it, and I think it's useful. Uh, but anyway, feedback is always welcome in that regard as well. So hopefully the reason you guys are here is for N219, the Principles and Applications of Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And for the first kind of 10 minutes and stuff, I'm just going to do the normal, kind of just go over the... Uh, the syllabus and some of the sort of activities that we have coming this quarter. There's some small things that you may not expect or know about yet, so uh, a couple of key points to begin with. Um, what I do want to start with, and you have to share this with all of your colleagues that are going to come in in five minutes, uh, because unfortunately this room's a little tricky to find, right? And I expect it probably will happen. Uh, but this is what I always show as my second slide, right? And this is the first question on your final exam. Okay, so this is kind of important. Uh, it's 5% uh, of your total grade or something like 5% of your total grade. Go ahead and find a better seat. You'll be more comfortable <laughs> not in the corner. And there's slides right there. If you've got the handouts. Uh, just to put Were there a bunch of extras of the slides? Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, Again, the point here was that this is important because it's already 5% of your grade. I'm giving you the first question on your final exam, right? And it's a failure on my part, and it may be a failure on your part if you can't answer this question, and if I haven't done enough to explain the answer to this question during the next 10 weeks, right? And so word for word, this is what you're going to see, and it's just a free-form answer. It's closed book. Uh, you're just going to do this from memory, and in two pages or less, you're going to write down and clearly explain to me how MRI works, and be sure to explain the role of various hardware components in converting proton spins into medical images, okay? It's a relatively straightforward question. The answer, in fact, is not terribly complicated, but it's gonna rely on a pretty comprehensive understanding of uh, the different lectures and different materials that we'll cover in 219 over the next few weeks. So don't forget this slide. Um, just general course overview stuff. I do have a website set up. We're in the middle, sort of still making some subtle minor changes, so it'll get updated a lot in the next kind of week. Uh, but everything for today is already there. The slides are already there. There's a little bit of MATLAB code that's already there. Uh, and later I'll post the video there as well. So this is the uh, web page for, uh, for the course itself. A little bit of ancillary material in that first link. Uh, more importantly is probably the syllabus. This is where you're actually going to find like links to all of the slides and so forth. So if you want a copy of the slides, if you want to review part of a lecture or something like that, uh, that's easy to do. In terms of how the uh, lab is, is or the course is constructed, there's going to be four homework assignments kind of spread out during the quarter, 15 points each. Uh, there's going to be two labs. We're actually going to go to the MRI scanners, similar to what uh, some of you did in 205, if you took 205. Um, we'll go to the MRI scanners in our clinical imaging center, and we'll actually have a hands-on experience using and operating the MRI scanners, uh, which will tie in, of course, to the course material as well. Uh, because these are clinical systems, the only time we can really get on those systems is between like 6 and 9 p.m. And we'll do it on these two specific dates. Uh, these are sort of tentatively scheduled, but I'll, I'll certify it uh, in the next kind of week. I just need to hear back from a, from a few people. So I think this ends up being like a Monday night and a Wednesday night. And, and I should say that uh, because there's always the potential for a typo or a mistake, I'll try to clarify at the beginning of a lecture if I ever need to, but the online syllabus should always be kind of like your go-to source. That's the thing that's easiest for me to update and get out to you guys. Um, and then we have a final exam, of course. Final exam is about 30, it will be 30 points of your total grade, 110 points for the entire course, so uh, not quite 30% of your grade. And I've already scheduled it for Wednesday the 16th from 1 to 4 p.m. So if that presents any kind of a conflict or a problem, let me know right away because I already have the room booked and I'm already planning to sort of do it on that particular day. I would ordinarily do it earlier in the week, but I already have some obligations on that Monday and Tuesday, so I can't. Um, this course uh, now and has, this will be the second year actually, that we're introducing uh, MATLAB as a course requirement. So 
Uh, if you don't have access to MATLAB, either on your personal machine or in lab space or somewhere on campus, let me know, and I'll try to sort that out with you. Uh, it is available in the bookstore for like $100, and you don't actually have to buy the book, which we'll talk about in just a second, because you can get it as PDFs through the UCLA library. So that's the only sort of uh, expectation is that you have access to MATLAB. If you haven't used MATLAB before, it's a programming language. It's a relatively simple and really wide, widely used programming language. Uh, it'll be a good skill to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, come up to speed on, probably for your research as well. Uh, and this is one way to get started with it. Uh, I pointed out a couple of ways to get going just with self-study during the first kind of two weeks of the class before you have your first homework assignments. Um, the TAs can also help with this. I'll introduce the TAs in just a second. And using MATLAB will essentially be required for the homeworks and for doing the lab. So you need to get beyond doing things in Excel or whatever else uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, sorry, questions about any of this sort of, sort of structural stuff? Um, there are a couple extra lectures. This quarter in particular, we have two Monday holidays. Uh, and I wouldn't want to deprive you of a lecture on MR physics by missing a Monday lecture. So I've scheduled two Friday lectures. They're as required as any other uh, Monday, Wednesday lecture. Uh, the resources, again, will be available online. So if that suits, that suits. Yeah, slides are just there. Uh, we're going to have one lecture this Friday, and then we'll have one lecture about two weeks later on a Friday. Same room, same time, just on Friday. And that'll help us stay uh, a pace of the material that I want to cover uh, this quarter. Uh, we don't have lectures on these two Mondays because those are uh, official holidays. And then hopefully these lab dates that I have here uh, coincide with what I said just a couple slides ago. Uh, but bottom line, this information, most updated information, will be available either at the beginning of lecture, uh, if there's a change, or on the course syllabus online. Uh, these are the books that I would uh, expect you to turn to. I, I, in principle, follow this book uh, on the left-hand side here called The Principles of Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's written by J.P. Liang, who's a very active MR researcher still, and the uh, late uh, Paul, uh, Paul Lauterberg, who got the 2003 uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his developments in MR. Really nice book. It is available through the UC system as PDF. Uh, it was available a couple days ago. I have no idea when it will become unavailable. I would download it right away. Uh, it's been there for years, so I expect they just have licensing in place for a bunch of IEEE books, and this happens to be one of them. Uh, but uh, good practice would be to grab it right away. I'll loosely follow this book uh, in terms of my mathematical sort of nomenclature and a little bit in sort of the structure of sort of the, the chapters themselves. Hello. There's some slides here. Um, this book should be on reserve in the library. If it's not on reserve, someone could let me know, and I'll make sure it gets placed on reserve. There are copies sort of available uh, uh, other places as well. These are just supplementary books. They're books that I turn to from time to time to pick up additional information uh, related to the, you know, the physics of MR. Uh, great reference texts. I think these are sort of go-to texts. Again, they're in the library, uh, so you could turn to them as you wanted to. Um, I won't point you probably very frequently to anything specific in these books, but they are other ways of sort of getting some additional information. Um, I will, from time to time, provide you with PDFs as well. There's no um, mandatory or required reading for this course. I really heavily rely on presenting to you the information that I expect you to know. Uh, so if you come to lecture, you're going you're gonna to learn what you need to, or I'm going to present what you need to know. Uh, these books are largely supplementary, even the primary book on the left side there. Uh, of course, there's a lot of online resources. I won't sort of uh, bore you with all of the uh, sort of possibilities you guys can search for these things as, as easily, easily and as well as I can. Uh, I don't yet have a Dropbox folder set up for this course yet, so uh, this this particular resource is not uh, uh, available in that way yet. I think it's still available on the web generally, though. Lots of other good resources as well. Uh, kind of lastly, before we really sort of get underway with the course material for today, um, I want to talk about the office hours and the TAs for the course. Um, if you want to talk with me specifically, that's always welcome. That's fine. Uh, the easiest time is to talk immediately after lecture. I don't think there's anything scheduled in this room, typically. I'm going to run pretty close to 3 o'clock, 1 to 3 o'clock almost every time. Um, but uh, you can easily ask me questions right after class uh, for you know as long as it takes to answer them. We can chat for a while. That's fine. 
Uh, and of course, you can always just email me and say, hey, you know, I need to, uh, I don't understand this, you know, lecture. I want to sit down for a half an hour. Uh, my preference, just as a matter of sort of sorting things out, is that you work with the TAs first. Catch me after lecture first. If that's not enough to answer your questions, reach out to the TAs. If that's still not quite enough, then go ahead and contact me. We've got some great TAs for, the, uh, for this course. Um, they'll be available generally in the Ubroff building, uh, which is down on the south end of the medical campus. I think I'm pointing in the right direction when I point that way, but we're in a funny building, right? Uh, anyway, Ubroff 1417, that's also the location of my office and my lab, so everyone's sort of situated there. Uh, and Eric, who's not here today, uh, but Patrick is here sitting in the front, raise his hand here, uh, and Mike, uh, both are researchers in my group and both know quite a bit about uh, uh, MR physics generally. Uh, Patrick has in fact taken this course before and Mike got his PhD a while ago and knows uh, a lot about MR physics generally. Uh, Mike's also agreed to sort of help out with some of the preliminary MATLAB uh, introductory material. So if, if some of you have just no background in MATLAB whatsoever, uh, reach out to Mike. He'll be available certainly during office hours on this Friday, for example, from four to five. Uh, if we need to schedule an additional session or something like that, I think Mike would be flexible enough to be able to accommodate that. Um, what I will say about office hours, you know, we're a busy lab. Everyone's always got tons of stuff to do. Uh, if you plan to go to office hours, just let them know. Just let them know that you're planning to drop by, you know, in that spot. Uh, that way they know to sort of be around and not sort of be, you know, off trying to get help or work on someone's project or whatever. Uh, so it's nice if you just give them a heads up that you're planning to drop by. It's not required, but it's a courtesy. Uh, and of course, we can always, if for some reason these times or you're feeling really crunched, if it's not working, uh, you can always uh, just contact us and arrange some kind of appointment to find some time to, to chat with you. Um, the only thing I'll say is we'll, I'll do my best to keep tabs on how people are doing with regards to sort of like exams and homeworks and things like this, mostly homeworks and labs, I guess, the sort of halfway point. But if you feel like you're struggling a little bit, that's not always obvious to me, you know, in the first few weeks, right, because the material moves pretty quickly on the quarter system, and we don't even evaluate the first homework until, you know, like the end of the third week or something like that. So, you know, reach out. That's the number one thing I can say. We've got lots of smart people to help. Uh, there will be a handful of invited speakers. You'll see this on the syllabus. Some of these are, uh, these are all faculty in radiology, uh, and Mike himself will give a lecture on a topic called phase contrast MRI later in the quarter. And these guys will help give some additional technical insight and expertise about MR generally. Uh, and then the two MDs, uh, Dr. Moriarty and Dr. Wynn, um, at the bottom left and bottom right, uh, they're going to come and share some of their clinical experience in the applications of MR. So that'll come in at the very sort of end of the lecture, or sorry, the end of the quarter, where we'll start tying in some kind of research topics and some actual clinical applications of MR. So hopefully your understanding of the math and physics of MR sort of comes home a little bit with these more advanced applications, uh, both in research and in the clinic. <clears throat> Cell phone policy. Please don't. Just don't. Right, that's all I can say. I, I understand we all sort of want to be on our mobiles whenever we can and whatnot, but it's really distracting, not just to me, but to other people in the room. So if you have to just step out, I don't really care. Uh, it's a little strange because we only have the middle aisle, but if you need to excuse yourself, just step out. But try to stay off your mobile when you're, while we're sitting here. Uh, I want to point out one last thing before we sort of get rolling here. Uh, Dr. Dan Ruan, uh, who's part of the physics and biology and medicine uh, faculty, is teaching another course this quarter as well, PBM 209, which is signal and Im image processing for biomedicine. As our coursework sort of gets, you know, increasingly streamlined, this course will actually probably be a prere prerequisite for 219. We haven't yet changed the structure of 219 this year. Uh, but this course offers a lot of good mathematical uh, uh, background for understanding some of the mathematical principles that we'll need to know for uh, this course. I still have some lectures and some material in place that will cover effectively the material that you need to know for this course. But if you don't have a background in convolution and signal processing and sampling theory and Fourier transforms and these kinds of topics, it would be great to sit in on these lectures. I've talked with Dan already. Anyone is welcome to sit in. I would contact her directly. And she's structured her course already such that the, few, the first probably four lectures are the ones that are most relevant and most tied to 219. So we're in this transition phase of sort of having this be a building block for 219, but as they overlap this quarter, uh, you might turn to this as a way of getting a little bit more background material, even if just for those first couple weeks, okay?
So uh, great instructor, great course, definitely relevant to 219. Uh, check it out if that uh, is an area that's going to help you. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll launch into the first lecture for the course. But first, are there questions about sort of just how things are structured and how we're going to run things? If you came, and I know a few people came in a little bit late. If you came in a little bit late, uh, pay particular attention to the slide. Uh, there's a bunch of details here and there. But the second slide in particular is, is your friend. Um, this is the first question on your final exam. Okay, that's all I'll say about it for now. You can go back and listen to the lecture recording if you need to. Okay, so this course is structured, in a, in a, at least initially through the first few lectures, to give you a good understanding of the hardware components that are essential and fundamental to uh, an MR machine. Uh, and as such, one of the first things we have to talk about is what we call the B0 field. Everyone knows magnetic resonance imaging uses a really large magnetic field. We call that the B0 field. It's what we, what's commonly referred to as being one and a half Tesla or three Tesla or maybe seven Tesla uh, for the most common sort of clinical imaging systems. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is the generation of the B0 field, a little bit of the mathematics of the B0 field. Uh, and, and, and then uh, when we come back on Wednesday, we'll talk more about kind of the, the importance and the relevance of the B0 field to uh, magnetic resonance imaging specifically. A little bit of background material uh, as well. This will be familiar to those of you that took 205 or have previously taken an MR uh, course before. Uh, nevertheless, we'll sort of work our ways through it. Uh, obviously, one of the guys that we'll talk about some today is Nikola Tesla. A uh, really interesting uh, inventor. If you don't know sort of the stories of his uh, sort of period of high productivity, uh, it's really a pretty interesting read. What I didn't know uh, until I actually started putting together this lecture is that he actually was working with x-rays as well uh, pretty early on. And this is an x-ray of a, of a hand taken by Tesla. And it's, it's thought, it's a little bit not known for sure, that Tesla may have inadvertently captured an x-ray image predating by a few weeks uh, Ronkin's December 1895 announcement of the discovery of x-rays. So, I mean, there really was a huge amount of sort of focus and, and emphasis on x-ray imaging. And, and when you think about it, uh, one of the reasons that MR imaging itself is so fascinating and why x-rays were so fascinating a century before that was you have this tool where you get inside to inside something. Right, and that's a really phenomenal sort of characteristic of imaging systems, right? We don't want to just be able to see outside of people, we want to be able to see inside of people. And x-rays really blew people's mind. There's another uh, picture where uh, Tesla apparently was taking, trying to take a picture of Mark Twain. Uh, and poor Mark Twain really got blasted because uh, the only thing that was visible in the image was a nail that was holding up like a screen, right? So there wasn't even like bony contrast, but nevertheless, that got sorted out later. Uh, but uh, what I didn't know is that Tesla was involved in x-ray imaging as well. And of course, it's his name that gives rise to the unit of measure that we use for high magnetic fields. So when we think about imaging systems, sometimes we think about where we are in the electromagnetic spectrum. There's a wide range of electromagnetic uh, uh, frequencies and, and concomitant wavelengths, if you will. And we could be at the far left-hand end of the of the, of the um, system, like an x-ray system, which is imaging with really uh, uh, really short wavelengths at very high frequencies. Uh, or we could be clear at the other end of the spectrum. And here at the far end of the spectrum, we have relatively long wavelengths. So the wavelengths uh, that are associated with the magnetic resonance imaging themselves on the order of tens of centimeters. Uh, and so if we're thinking about a one and a half Tesla system, it's maybe 25 or 30 centimeters. And that gets, or you know, it's like 45 or 50 centimeters, and that gets halved when you go to like a three Tesla system. So these are really long wavelengths that we use for imaging. And as a consequence, it was uh, early on thought that MR maybe wouldn't be the most appropriate sort of uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum to operate in. X rays, you know, PET imaging, they're way at this high frequency, low wavelength end of the spectrum. So MR wasn't really an obvious, uh, it wasn't obvious that MR would contribute meaningfully to the imaging landscape. And the main reason for that was what's called the Rally criteria. So uh, a simple statement of which is that the resolution limit of any imaging system is on the order of the wavelength used for imaging. So you think you want really short wavelengths so you can resolve and have a good point spread function. You have two points that you want to resolve. You need really short wavelengths to resolve if they're really close to each other. 
Uh, and with MR, where the wavelength is on the order of tens of centimeters, it wasn't really obvious this would be good for an imaging system. And in fact, uh, a very famous person, Richard Ernst, who got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1991 for his work in MR, uh, is sometimes quoted as, as saying, and it's in fact in one of his books, that the resolution for radio frequency pulses in NMR wouldn't be sufficient even for imaging elephants. Right. So going back far enough, you know, going back not that long ago, you know, 50 years, 65 years ago, something like that, it wasn't obvious that this phenomena could even be used for imaging. It was an interesting sort of quirk of physics. It was observable. Uh, it was fascinating. But that it could become an imaging system wasn't really obvious uh, for quite some time. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't until the 2003 Nobel Prize was awarded that it was, you know, sort of it was obviously uh, abundantly clear at that point, but it, it wasn't until this millennia that it was actually awarded uh, a Nobel Prize related specifically to imaging uh, with the NMR phenomena. So what is MRI? Probably this is something you know well already. We know we need something magnetic. We need a big magnetic field. We measure that typically in units of Tesla, and that's why we sort of give a little applause there to Nikola Tesla. We have to take advantage of the so-called resonance phenomena. Uh, the excitation energy that we're going to use, uh, we have to be able to put energy into our system, and that energy will effectively come back out of the system. That, ex that excitation energy has to be on resonance with something. We'll learn about this more tomorrow, but the excitation energy has to be on resonance with water. And what that really means, again, will be a, a big focus of tomorrow's lecture. But this really is a classic excitation reception paradigm. You're going to put energy, exciting energy, into the system, and that's going to uh, have a, another form of energy come out of the system that's detectable and can be received. And I make that distinction uh, uh, relative to, say, like a CT or, a, or an X-ray system, where you're transmitting X-rays through the cavity or through the body and picking it up with a detector on the other side. Uh, and that's a transmission, uh, an, like an excitation transmission system, rather than sort of receiving back out. Minor distinction, but I think a, an important one. And then needless to say, the last thing we can do with these systems is imaging, right? That's why they're so interesting to us. We can look inside of otherwise solid objects, and we can make pretty pictures. So uh, just a little bit more about sort of what is MRI. This is all going to kind of come together as we learn more about the hardware components that are required here. But we're going to learn a lot about different magnetic fields that we need. We need the big B0 field. That's the main magnetic field. We'll talk about why we need that a little bit more tomorrow. We also need to use what's called a B1 field. B just means magnetic field, and we just distinguish them as being the B0 field, the B1 field. And the B1 field is this exciting field. It's an electromagnetic field. And it has energy at a particular frequency such that it can excite water. And so we're going to use radio frequency magnetic fields to excite water in, uh, in the body or in uh, some object of interest. And that's going to give rise to a signal that we can record or receive. And that signal is called an FID or it's called an echo. We're going to get into a lot more detail about all of these things sort of in the next you know, several lectures. But this is what we mean by sort of excitation reception. Energy goes in to the body and, ex and energy comes back out of the body that can be received and then digitally recorded uh, by a nearby computer. And fundamental to all of this is Faraday's law of induction. So this is just a simple example of someone moving a bar magnet uh, you know, uh, towards and away from uh, a coil. A coil is just several loops of wire. Those several loops of wire are linked up to a voltmeter. Sorry, my screen is doing crazy things up here. Uh, this uh, magnet is uh, moving back and forth relative to the coil. Through Faraday's law of induction, that magnetic field induces, uh, that moving magnetic field causes a flux through the coil. That flux induces a current, and that current is measurable, say, as a voltage here. Uh, and this same principle is actually fundamental to the NMR signal reception. We heavily rely on Faraday's law of induction to receive uh, the underlying NMR signal. Uh, one of the big tricks and one of the things that we'll have to sort of get at as this course unfolds is how we uh, can encode spatial information. That is, how can we figure out where a signal is coming from, what slice, what pixel is the information coming from, and then how do we actually encode not just spatial information but image contrast. We want to be able to have images that aren't just sort of flat and of no interest, but rather have lots of contrast between uh, different tissues and different, uh, 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 different uh, organs, for example. And so the real trick is encoding both spatial information and image contrast in the underlying echo. Okay, so 
what we're going to talk about, having sort of that sort of just very general sense about MRIs, we'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages, what motivates an interest in MR in the first place. Uh, but of course, when we talk about the things that are great about a technology, there's always some downsides as well. And we want to be relatively even handed about that, despite the fact that MR is the best imaging modality out there. <clears throat> so what are some advantages of using uh, uh, MR in the first place? Well, one of the big ones is soft tissue contrast, right? When we think of x-rays, when we think of CT images, we tend to have less contrast between soft tissues in particular. And this is just a nice example, a whole body MR, uh, where we can see clearly that there are different gray levels corresponding to different tissue types. And so if you look at uh, this here as fat, this is just subcutaneous fat, uh, or this is marrow inside of the bones. Uh, marrow, which is a fatty substance, and subcutaneous fat, of course, is fatty, on this particular image appears quite bright. And that's in distinction to, say, muscle, which is appearing as a relatively dark gray, and darker gray than, say, liver. And so the whole, you know, one of the big key advantages of MR is the ability to generate so-called soft tissue contrast. And we'll talk about the mechanisms, how we actually generate contrast, uh, only when we get farther into the course. Uh, soft tissue contrast in MR can also be adjusted, which is really remarkable. So it's not just that we have contrast between tumors and normal appearing white matter or gray matter or between a fatty lipoma in the you know chest versus some uh, some other uh, uh, tumor um, but it's the idea that we can actually manipulate the contrast without really changing anything that the patient sees or feels or undergoes so the image on the far hand uh, the far left hand side here is what we call a proton density weighted image we'll get into a lot more about this later but it's a pretty flat contrast image right there's not a lot of soft tissue contrast between these different uh, tissue types that you see in this axial image of the head but just by tuning some parameters on the MR machine if we change the, what we call the echo time or we change the uh, the repetition time or we change the inversion time or the flip angle there's all these parameters that we can change we can get a very different picture of the underlying uh, anatomy for that particular patient. And this becomes a really useful thing uh, diagnostically because sometimes on, on a single uh, uh, form of image contrast, say this image here, uh, we can't quite distinguish two different soft tissues. They look quite similar. But when we come to a, a very different weighting, say on this right-hand side here, maybe then a tumor becomes very apparent. And we begin to understand something about its MR properties of a particular tissue and its MR properties begin to give us some insight about diagnosis. Is something uh, uh, an invasive cancerous tumor or is something uh, just an abscess that needs to be drained? And we can't otherwise do that well, uh, aside from using techniques like, uh, uh, like MR. Uh, and the ability to adjust the soft tissue contrast is really a huge uh, advantage of this technique. And any MR exam, uh, whether you're imaging someone's knee or their neck or their back or their head, when you go to the MR scanner, they're going to acquire multiple contrasts, multiple kinds of MR image contrast so that they can make the most accurate diagnosis uh, possible. What this leads to, what it's leading to now when you think of MR in the research context, is increasingly towards quantitative tissue characterization. So while radiologists for years and years have looked at grayscale images and having looked at 10,000 training sets can identify uh, something with pretty high specificity and high sensitivity, the goal now is to go beyond just these qualitative observations and really try to push for things to be increasingly quantitative. If you know something about PET imaging, PET imaging is inherently a very quantitative imaging technique. MR imaging, much less so, uh, and yet it's a big uh, sort of impetus in research right now. So this is just an example. I won't go into all of the details, but it comes from Paul Thompson's uh, lab that does a lot of neuroimaging. Uh, and you can see that on this, what we call a T1 weighted image uh, on the left, you can see that the tumor is very apparent uh, and very easily delineated. Uh, but on this edema imaging that's shown on the right, or this T2 image that's shown on the right, it's much more difficult to distinguish where there's an area of edema and where there's an area of tumor. And using image processing and using what we know and understand about the MR physics, we can do a much better job of isolating and identifying uh, specifically regions that are tumor versus regions that are edema versus regions that are uh, an abscess versus, you know, something else. So quantitative imaging in MR is a, is a huge thing right now. It has been for a while, but it's really getting a lot of push now. Another nice advantage of MR is the ability to acquire images in arbitrary imaging planes. And so it doesn't really matter what region of the anatomy we need to get an image of. We need to uh, obviously place that part of the anatomy inside the, the, the most sensitive volume of interest for the scanner itself. 
We also have to use a coil. We'll talk much more about coils later, but we have coils for the wrist, we have coils for the shoulder, we have coils for the head and neck, chest, outer abdomen. And each of those coils helps us isolate signals from the region of interest. Uh, and in, in being able to isolate regions of interest, we can also uh, image at arbitrary imaging planes. So a lot of conventional tomographic imaging systems, CT and PET, for example, uh, you don't really get arbitrary imaging planes in the acquisition sense. You typically get a set of axial slices, and you may digitally reformat those later to give you uh, the image or the slice that you want. With MR, it's a slightly different approach. You usually acquire the slice that you want uh, and use that for the diagnostic evaluation. And so in the head, we may easily get sagittal slices or axial slices. Uh, those are relatively straightforward things to do. When it comes to imaging the heart, there are preferred uh, orientations that the clinicians like to see. And that requires, uh, that requires obtaining a slice that's not strictly an axial slice or a sagittal slice or a coronal slice, but rather a slice that we call is doubly oblique. It's oriented doubly obliquely in 3D space. MR has the flexibility to let you acquire any imaging plane. Uh, and that's a nice advantage for giving the physician the very specific view that's most diagnostically useful for them. No ionizing radiation, right? So I, I try not to make too much fun of my friends that work in, in CT, uh, but, but we still make fun of them a little bit. Um, but the, the bottom line is we don't use ionizing radiation in MR. There are, of course, very useful ways in which ionizing radiation is used, uh, therapeutically, diagnostically, uh, so, so forth and so on. Uh, but MR uh, needn't use ionizing radiation for any diagnostic uh, research purpose. Uh, something that's really active area of work in my group in particular, and, and certainly other groups around the world, is uh, using MR to capture an image physiologic motion. So these are very sort of routinely acquired images, cardiac images. Uh, so here you're seeing the left ventricle of the heart contracting during the cardiac cycle. It's contracting to squeeze out blood. The blood pool is seen here. And there's a tremendous amount of anatomical detail seen here. We can easily pick out the wall thickening as the heart's contracting. We can see the diameter changing as well. You can see these bright vessels inside the lung field sort of moving and deforming as the heart is, uh, is undergoing its cardiac cycle. We can look really carefully and we can see the mitral valve leaflets here uh, flowing and flapping back and forth as the uh, ventricle is first filling and then contracting to close this valve. And you can just barely make out the aortic valve over in this position here. So imaging physiologic motion is a really you know, remarkable and, 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 and phenomenal thing that MR can do. It, it works exceptionally well for very regular motions like cardiac motion, uh, but it can be uh, adapted and used as well in so-called real-time imaging mode uh, to image things that are more spontaneous like respiration or head and neck movements uh, uh, or lung motion, things like this. Uh, so imaging physiologic motion is, is clinically useful, but also a really interesting research topic for uh, my group in particular. Uh, as I said, MR isn't just all uh, advantages. There are some disadvantages that are worth uh, pointing out and discussing. Probably the most obvious one right off the bat is the expense associated with uh, purchasing an MR system, about a million dollars per Tesla, citing one. So if you want to cite an MR scanner uh, on a university setting, it's extremely expensive. Hospital real estate is extremely expensive, for example. Uh, you have to maintain it at usually hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. You'll have a service contract that's going to run you $10,000 a year per scanner or something like this so that you can maintain your uptime. So these things uh, can be used and operated on a nearly 24-7 basis. Uh, and that's important because you can operate these things at about $500 per hour, right? So if you're thinking of it as, a, as part of your clinical enterprise, you want uptime on your MR systems because every hour that you're using them, you're able to generate revenue uh, through whatever, whoever the payer is for that particular uh, scan. So uptime is important. And you'll find if you run a clinical imaging center, you can have patients or patients that love coming in very early because they happen to wake up early, uh, particularly older men love having an MR exam at seven in the morning because I already woke up at five. Uh, and then there are other people that want to come in after work. So they want to have an MR exam when they're done with their day. And so operating an MR uh, uh, imaging center from 7 in the morning until 10 or 11 at night is, is actually uh, pretty common, uh, uh, and in part because it helps you offset your operational costs. MR is technically challenging, right? So one of the sort of dreams, one of the things that people talk about a lot is making MR much more of a push button technology. It's very far from being push button right now. You'll get that sense when you sit through the two labs that we have for this class, 
Uh, but if you were to come to even a clinical exam, you'd get the sense very quickly that this is not a push button technology. As advanced as it is, it's not at that point yet. Lots of reasons for that. I won't go into all of them, but there's lots of parameters to adjust. If you go through and sit down at the, at the computer that runs the scanner itself, there are literally pages and pages and pages of free parameters. And that means each one of you that learns to operate an MR scanner becomes your own little nonlinear optimizer, right? You have to have all these parameters and you have to figure out, okay, I gotta get on this way and adjust this one, turn this up, turn this down, and that should work. Okay, it didn't work. So I gotta turn this up, but I don't turn this down, turn this to the left, and up and up and over. And up. okay, that worked. So lots of parameters. Now this class is geared towards giving you some insight so that if you're changing a parameter, you know that things are gonna go more one way than the other, and you can get the signal to noise that you want, the image contrast that you want. Uh, the acquisition efficiency that you want, uh, but nevertheless, it's technically challenging to have sufficient understanding to know how to change all of these uh, different parameters. Uh, you may be involved, uh, or the, the scan itself may require some physiologic monitoring. If we're imaging the cardiac cycle, we may need an ECG to synchronize our imaging system to uh, that specific patient's heart rate. Uh, we may be uh, monitoring their respiration. We may have to monitor their blood pressure if we're administering any kind of uh, pharmacologic agent at the same time. Uh, if they're fully uh, anesthetized, we probably are monitoring exhaled uh, CO2 as well. So it can get the setup can get a little bit complicated in that sense as well. Uh, we may require breath holding if we're imaging typically the abdomen or the chest. Uh, we need people to hold their breath because one thing you'll learn is MR imaging is relatively slow. So for us to acquire an image is typically going to take hundreds of milliseconds, if not minutes. And if you want to minimize uh, artifacts caused by breathing or abdominal motion, people typically have to hold their breath. Now, we don't want our patients to hold their breaths for minutes, so we have to address that in a different way. Uh, but breath holding is not an, uh, an uncommon uh, sort of request that we make of our patients. Uh, we may be administering contrast agents, and that incurs some other overhead. We need to make sure we have the right clinical staff in place, we have an injector, we have someone that can introduce the needle, it makes the contrast agent, just some other complexity that prevents MR from being, say, bedside, simple, super straightforward. Uh, a more subtle thing would be coil selection. You have to, of course, pick the right coil for imaging the specific anatomy of interest. And then even when it comes to the actual imaging exam itself, the anatomic localization is non-trivial, right? So if I asked each of you to sit down with a scanner that otherwise gave you the, all the parameters to use, and I said, okay, can you please or, you know, find the horizontal long axis to you for this particular patient's heart? Uh, that's not an easy thing to do. You have to know your 3D anatomy really well if you're going to really leverage this ability to acquire arbitrary imaging planes. So a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of uh, even physiologic or anatomical knowledge is, is needed as well to get a good, high-quality clinical MR exam. Uh, contraindications of, uh, as well, right? We can't just put any patient through our MR systems. We have to be conscientious of what things about them may limit our ability to acquire an MR exam safely in a particular patient. So some relative contraindications, meaning we have to know more about what's going on before we can determine that it is or is not likely to be safe for those patients to undergo an MR exam. They may have cochlear implants, insulin pumps, nerve stimulators, all kinds of wires, meshes, um, stents, all kinds of implanted medical devices, some of which are perfectly safe in an MR environment and some of which are not. Uh, we're especially conscientious of imaging women that are pregnant, not because we know MR causes any uh, known harm to the fetus, but people are just especially conscientious in that, in that setting. So uh, sometimes people will wait until the second or you know, third trimester if they can, or postpartum if they can, if it's someone's knee exam, and it's not, uh, say, clinically uh, uh, urgent that they have this particular exam. Some patients will be claustrophobic, right? Not everyone wants to climb inside a little tiny tube and close their eyes or listen to a bunch of noise for half an hour or 60 minutes, right? Uh, just that sense of narrow space is uncomfortable for some people. We have to be conscientious of that when we're working with research subjects as well as our patients uh, and do our best to accommodate them in the most appropriate way. Some people can be kind of coached through it and some people need some coaching during an exam. Other people need to take sedatives so that they can actually relax enough to go through an MR exam. Uh, this is one that gets mentioned in a lot of textbooks as tattoos. I'm not aware of this actually being a specific problem at any particular time, but apparently some of the inks that are used in tattoos can have uh, um, ferromagnetic uh, uh, inks based, iron based inks, uh, and those can lead to heating. So tattoos, some tattoos or some particular inks used in tattoos 
could uh, heat up and potentially be uncomfortable, uh, probably in the worst case. So relative contraindications, we can kind of manage these. We know how to sort of understand the problem well enough to sort of deal with it. There are some other what are considered broadly as absolute contraindications. So imaging patients with specific implanted devices like pacemakers and ICDs uh, is, is, a, is a very, uh, I'll call it cutting edge sort of area of both research and clinical medicine right now. Broadly, the FDA does not consider this safe. And yet there are so-called tier one clinical imaging centers like UCLA, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, others that do image patients with pacemakers and ICDs, but under very sort of controlled circumstances. And I won't sort of belabor that point because it's still very much considered a, it's kind of a research venture, if you will. Uh, it's something that requires considerable uh, care uh, and considerable oversight. So it's only done under sort of, uh, sort of very strict circumstances, if you will. Uh, a, a, a potentially worse situation would be like a ferromagnetic hemostat clip. Someone's maybe had surgery and they have a little ferromagnetic, meaning it's pulled or attracted to the MR scanner, and it's a clip that's, that's clipping off a little vessel. And if that clip were to get pulled or tugged or torqued free, or in such a way that that vessel were to open up again, that patient could bleed perhaps considerably and have a very serious medical event. So we have to be very conscientious of what patients come to when they visit our MR imaging systems. You guys will confront this a little bit when you do one of the labs because I'll give you an MR safety screening uh, form because I want to make sure that when I bring you into the MR scanner suite, I'm not going to have a liability or have a problem. Uh, so it's something that we really have to be conscientious of is the overall safety of patients, research uh, uh, subjects in the presence of the MR field and, and exposure to the fields during the MR exam itself. Metal in the eye is potentially a problem because it's small little flecks of metal that metal workers might get can heat up. The eye has a very low uh, perfusion capacity, so it doesn't cool itself very well. So there can be a kind of a heat imbalance there that can lead to some uh, uh, damage. And then uncooperative patients may in fact require anesthesia, right? So if there are patients that can't follow directions for a variety of reasons, whether that's uh, age, very old or very young, or otherwise just doesn't follow directions well, uh, that may require uh, general anesthesia uh, to, to uh, acquire sort of a, a good high quality MR exam. And of course that incurs a lot of overhead to do so. Um, so we'll touch on these really as we get through each of the different uh, hardware components. Today we're really gonna, and momentarily, we're gonna get focused on the main field, the B0 field. Uh, the main risk there is what we call the projectile risk. You've got a large magnetic field. It will pull things out of your pockets. It will pull hemostat clips free, ferromagnetic hemostat clips free from uh, vessels and so forth. And we have to be very conscientious that people don't go into the MR scanner suite with something that's ferromagnetic that inadvertently gets pulled out of their hands, out of their pockets, off of their hat or their glasses or whatever it is, and flies into the scanner with considerable speed and hurts someone. And in fact, my CT colleagues not infrequently will remind me that it's only with certainty that MR uh, is known to have caused deaths, whereas CT, it's really statistically, it leads to potentially some problem. But with MR, we know that people have died because someone unwittingly walked into an MR scanner suite with, a, with an iron uh, a ferromagnetic oxygen canister, and the oxygen canister flies into the scanner at 30 miles an hour, it weighs 25 pounds, and the person was killed. So that didn't happen here, thankfully, but it's a very real risk. It's something that people have to be very conscientious of in this particular imaging environment. We're gonna to get to a lot of these other sort of uh, effects as we go. Uh, so I won't sort of belabor the point right now, but each of the different magnetic fields that we use in MR uh, confers a different sort of safety consideration, if you will. And they're usually related to patient comfort and or patient heat. Uh, as regards the B0 field, you have to remember that the powerful magnet is always on, right? We're going to talk about the construction and the design of these B0 uh, magnetic fields shortly, but we don't turn them off at the end of the day. We don't turn them on when we come into work in the morning. They're so-called ramped up at the time that they're installed, and unless there's the requirement because of servicing that the field be ramped down, they stay up. And they stay up typically for, you know, dozens of, well, I should say months and months, if not even, you know, a couple of years. Uh, on the, uh, uh, under unfortunate circumstances where someone isn't completely aware of the environment in which they're walking into, then there are all kinds of sort of disaster photos of, of IV poles and floor buffers and office chairs and crash carts flying into and sticking to MR scanners. 
And were there a patient in the scanner at this point in time, you could easily, you know, cause a you know, severe laceration or break their arm or their leg or their knee. And in the worst case scenario, you could crush their head. So you have to be extremely conscientious of this, uh, of this environment. Uh, another possibility, we, we talked about this a little bit already, but it's the force and torque that can be exerted on implanted devices. So if this were a ferromagnetic stent, while the patient is being advanced into the scanner, it can be torqued and twisted a little bit. And then it could also be pulled, of course, towards the main magnetic field itself. And we have to know as our patients present or research, subject, pre, research subjects present, what devices do they have implanted in them? Some people know they had a procedure, but they don't know what device has been implanted. And then it becomes our job and the clinical staff's job to try to narrow down specifically which model of which device is implanted so we can know something about its construction and know that it can or cannot be imaged safely. Some devices, stainless steel devices, platinum devices, not a problem. There may be a heating risk, but they're not going to torque and force or be pulled because they're non-ferromagnetic. Uh, lots of uh, uh, device manufacturers are conscientious that their uh, that their um, clientele, if you will, are going to subsequently need an MR exam for some reason or another. So they design around this. They don't design with ferromagnetic materials generally. Uh, and yet, because patients presenting could easily have a device that's 30 years old, uh, we have to be conscientious of that and uh, make sure we uh, uh, know specifically what a patient has. Let's see if this would work. So uh, another consideration, and this is really more related to the, to the gradients, but the MR system, if you've ever been near it, if you've ever had an MR exam, it's quite noisy. Uh, and that's a function of the gradients, the so-called gradients that we use that are specifically required for spatial localization, something we'll talk about much later in the class. Uh, but the gradients generate a lot of noise, uh, a lot of audible noise that can be, that's, that all by itself is uncomfortable and requires the use of either earplugs, headphones, or both. Uh, and so typically before going into the MR scan, you'll be provided with one of these two things. Uh, if in the case of the headphones, they also include two-way communication so that we can talk back and forth with the person that's in the scan, of course. Uh, so the large acoustic noise needs to be abated, uh, if you will. Again, we'll touch on safety considerations of MR sort of as the course sort of uh, rolls on rather than sort of touching on it in a, in a single specific lecture. Uh, what I want to do now is kind of outline a little bit some structure for how this course is going to flow, some of the requirements for MRI, and then finally, I've been saying it a few times now, but finally then talk about this main B0 uh, field itself. As regards the real requirements for an MR, one of the things you have to have available, so to speak, is an NMR active nuclei. And we'll talk about what that means some today, and we'll talk about it more uh, tomorrow as well. But not all nuclei, if you will, are NMR visible, right? Only some things are. Fortunately, uh, hydrogen is. Uh, protons are NMR visible. And fortunately, our bodies are 90 whatever percent hydrogen, and so they're very easily imaged with an NMR imaging uh, system. Other things are NMR active nuclei as well. We'll touch on that in just a second. We obviously need a, a main magnetic field. This is our B0 field. And uh, in tomorrow's lecture, we'll learn, or sorry, Wednesday's lecture, we'll learn more about this. But this B0 field is our polarizer. Uh, it's what sort of enables or makes available the so-called NMR signal itself. We also need uh, an RF system, the B1 or the exciter. We need gradients, and we need some coils for receiving. I'm not going to get into these sort of different hardware components today. Uh, I'm not going to get into these different hardware components today, except for a very sort of broad sort of overview sense. This is a, kind of one of the more important structural slides for this course, because it outlines how we're going to make our way through uh, understanding how an MR system uh, works. Uh, we'll, we'll really get into you know, this as a whole uh, uh, course proceeds. It takes about a week for each of these things to sort of develop. Today, what we're talking about is the B0 field. Uh, when we come back on, we'll talk about how we create and generate the B0 field. Uh, Wednesday, when we come back, we'll talk more about magnetic moments and generating so-called bulk magnetization. And as the course proceeds, we'll talk about the B1 field that we need for exciting, the gradients that we use for encoding and decoding spatial information, the coils that we need, and all of the sort of mathematics of signal acquisition and reconstruction. So. No need to really focus on sort of the individual steps of this slide right now, but this is going to come back in almost every lecture, at least for the first half of the course, 
And the basic idea is just showing you how we go from individual magnetic dipoles, that's the behavior of a hydrogen uh, nucleus itself, and how that magnetic dipole, through the application of different magnetic fields at specific points in time, can ultimately allow us to form an image. Okay, so by the end of the course, this will be a good structure to use for answering that first question on your on your final, right? Because this lays out what I think to be sort of the important hardware components and the sort of sequence of events needed to generate an MR uh, image at the end of the day. Uh, if we look at a teardown on an MR scanner, we're going to get into each of these hardware components as we go, uh, but a typical MR scanner would look something like this. The thing that we're most interested in today is the so-called main coil, or this B0 field. It's these green windings. These are windings of coil, continuous winding of coil on the outside of the scanner. We'll learn about this, uh, it, it, the construction of it a little bit more uh, as we go. Uh, but it's the essential component for generating that B0 field, that main magnetic field. Other hardware components are shown here, the X, Y, and Z gradient coils, which are needed for spatial localization. And then this body coil down here, which we use for transmitting and potentially for receiving uh, the B1 field, which is our exciting field, but also our received field as well. Uh, the cryostat, which is also shown here, is just what contains the liquid, uh, the liquid helium uh, to keep the main coil windings uh, superconducting, keeps them really cold so we can maintain a, a large current and a large magnetic field. So a good sort of teardown diagram of what the inside of an MR scanner looks like. Uh, we talked about these different requirements, right? We need an NMR active nuclei, we need a B0 field, and that's what we're going to sort of wrap up today with, is describing and discussing those two different things. When it comes to NMR active nuclei, the thing that we really care about, I said it before, but the thing we really care about is just hydrogen. It's, it's, it's very abundant in our bodies, obviously, uh, and it happens to have really good NMR properties that make it a very visible, uh, uh, very visible to us in the NMR sense. Uh, it's a, it's our ability to image it is a consequence of, of spin, charge, and mass. We'll talk about this on Wednesday. You're probably familiar, of course, with charge and mass. You may or may not be uh, familiar with the inherent property of spin, but we'll talk about spin much more uh, in the next lecture. This is just a large table of different uh, NMR active nuclei. No reason to sort of memorize this whole table. This just sort of stands to point out that there are lots of different NMR active uh, nuclei, if you will. <laughs> we can, for example, just compare uh, uh, H1 and H2. They have different spin. We haven't learned about this yet, but they have uh, 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 different quantum spin numbers. They have very different natural abundances, and this matters to us a lot, right? 99% of hydrogen is H1, and only a small percentage of it is H2. So in our bodies, we don't have very much H2. We'll learn more about the gyromagnetic ratio on Wednesday as well, but one thing we'll come to understand is that uh, H1 behaves like a little tiny mag like a little tiny magnet, we call it a dipole, and it, and it wobbles around at a very specific free frequency, and that frequency is governed by the gyromagnetic ratio. So we have frequency per Tesla. So depending on what field strength we're exposed to, we'll be precessing at a different frequency. 64 megahertz for a one and a half Tesla scanner, 125, 128 megahertz for a three Tesla scanner. Um, when it comes to sensitivity, we, de we define hydrogen uh, H1 as being a relative sensitivity of one. Everything is relative to hydrogen because it's the easiest thing for us to image. So it's taken as the standard, if you will. And because of its high natural abundance, the absolute sensitivity, just the product of its sensitivity and its natural abundance, its absolute sensitivity is quite high as well. You can work through the same example for H2. Uh, we know the abundance is low. We know its gyromagnetic ratio is quite a bit slower. Uh, and in the end, it means its absolute sensitivity is three orders of magnitude lower. So our ability to see or detect or measure things at uh, H2 uh, are very, very limited, if you will. Uh, as a warm-up for getting you more familiar with using MATLAB, uh, I realize that might be a little hard to read in the, in the back of the um, room, but this is just a little Mat MATLAB snippet uh, that just uh, uses some things that we know, defining some constants, about the gyromagnetic ratio for H1 and H2. They just come out of this table. Uh, the spin state for H1 and H2 just comes out of this table. Natural abundance comes out of this table. And then how can we calculate their sensitivity, their relative sensitivity, and their absolute sensitivity? So uh, this all really falls out of the numbers in this table and this uh, relationship on the bottom here that the relative sensitivity is constant in a magnetic field 
uh, an equal number of nuclei, and you just need to use this gamma factor of 11 fourths. You'll see it showing up here in these expressions. The only reason I'm really sharing this MATLAB code, it's also available on the website, is just if you have no familiarity with MATLAB, this is a simple script that lets you define some variables and make some basic calculations. So if you have no familiarity with MATLAB, I would run this script just to see that you can get the numbers that show up in the, uh, in the table as well. Uh, okay, so hydrogen shows up in lots of places in our body, obviously. Its principal uh, 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 local uh, location is going to be the, the hydrogen that are bound to oxygen to form water, but it also can be in the CH2 groups, for example, to form triglycerides. And for better or for worse, if we're 90-something if we're, if we're percent water, we're 99-point-something percent water and fat, right? Uh, so it makes it easy for us to see uh, with uh, MR imaging in general. We said and showed this image before about the ability to get soft tissue contrast in MR images. Uh, one thing that's important to recognize is where we get MR signal from, but also where we do not get MR signal from. It should be obvious that we get it from H1 in particular uh, in the human body. Uh, and that means that we get signals from soft tissues like muscles and organs and fat. Uh, but we also get good MR signal from fluids like CSF, blood, synovial fluid, uh, for example. If you look carefully at this image, you might pick up that the blood, in, this is the heart here, that the blood inside the heart is actually quite dark. Uh, and I just told you here that we get signal from blood. But this is an effect of being able to widely manipulate the contrast in an MR image. We haven't talked about how we do that yet, but there are ways to manipulate the contrast to make any tissue black or very, very dark. And that becomes diagnostically very useful. We can make blood dark. We can make fat dark. We can make CSF dark. And that gives you uh, sort of uh, conspicuity that the clinicians like for isolating, uh, the, you know, what is a particular tissue uh, as it appears in an MR image. Uh, while it's important to recognize where we get signal from, we also want to know where we do not get signal from, right? So we don't get signal from heart tissues, or we don't get very much signal from things like cortical bone, ligaments, tendons, teeth. And so if you look at the cortical bone here in the humerus, these black stripes, uh, very, very little MR signal from very hard structures, if you will. Uh, we also don't tend to get MR signal from gases. That's lung in the airspace, the sinuses, the bowel. There's nothing there to, to produce uh, uh, much in the way of MR signal. Uh, and so they typically appear quite dark. Okay, so that's a quite a bit of background material uh, before we actually get into the B0 field itself, but that's our next job. Why don't we take just a few minute break? I can answer questions for a couple minutes if you guys want to, and then we'll get into these B0 field, uh, B0 slides for a couple, or for the remainder of the lecture. Okay. There is just outside here, I think both restrooms are there. I think there's a water fountain that's just there, so feel free to take advantage of that. And why don't we just start back up and like five minutes? Does that sound good? No disagreement? So, I asked about the diffusion MRI. Uh, so, my question was like, how this book in particular, how, how good would you consider it of a reference? Because my previous class that I took yeah. on this yeah, yeah. was taught with this book yeah. by one of the authors. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I, know no, I think it's, I think it's a very good book. Um, I think these three together are, are, are like best of like a set. 
Okay. It, it's because I'm just trying to get a, a feel for exactly how well known that book is. Well, that's a very, no, that's a that's a very well known book. The, 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 the thing I like about this book is it's not quite as exhaustive. Mm -hmm. This is a more exhaustive. Oh, yeah. Text. Yeah. So I, I have the whole book. Yeah. Three or five times as much material, and it, you, you just can't cover it in class like this. We're going to cover three quarters of what's in this book. Yeah. Uh, it would be impossible to do it. It's a, it's a fantastic text. It has, I borrow material from it. Yeah, it's, I, it, was, it was good, and I, I really like the way that it lays out the equations in that book. Yeah, but, uh, yeah it's, a, it's a good mathematical text for sure. This, this probably has a bit more mathematical about sort of physics in the system. Oh, this is a little bit more mathematical about signal acquisition and signal More on the engineering side. More on the signal processing side. I mean, that's, I think that's the subtitle, right? A single process in the first Yes. Uh, this is a great book, too. It's, it's, it, it is very much a pen. It tells you kind of what you want to know, but not everything you need to know. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive, but if you really want to know and really understand something, you probably have to go past it. It'll point you in the right direction. All right. Uh, but it's not quite a good one. It's, it's a hit. Uh, these are good sort of like spin level quantum books. <laughs> so on all the stuff that PBM yeah. people will hopefully be like, mm, maybe get someone else. Yeah, that. and we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell on that stuff at all. Right. But it always leaves at least a few people with questions. Right? Does that? Mm -hmm. I understand. This is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not an I'm, I'm not an insurance physicist, so we don't cover the quantum. Yeah. Those of us that are physicists or have taken physics classes, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't want to go back well, through it. For, for MR, it's not strictly the US. I don't really know basically yeah. everything yeah. that I know about MR without There are some interesting things about side effects that you know, not big Cool, cool. I always like knowing exactly. Yeah, people yeah. If you had a Hakey book, so Hakey, who was your instructor before? Um, Bob Brown. Oh, okay. Well, so he, he was sort of like the assistant instructor because he, I don't know, it was weird. There were two other instructors, but he was also taking care of everything. So, but either way, he was so Hakey is speaking here. Uh, okay. <laughs> and the book, if you have it, is still a great reference. It's up to you. <laughs> How's your holiday? Good, good, good. Sorry, I didn't get back to you. Yeah, so that's harder. No, no, no. I mean, it's good to be better to focus on your classes. The main thing you're here for. Which course was it? Yeah. 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 Which, sorry, what class? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I made a lecture in 180. Like, for me, so it's a ton. I think it's kind of see that's a good class. It shouldn't be a ton. Yeah, I'm excited for it. I had a quick question about this. It well, it depends, right? So, for, for gas phases, definitely that's the case. Bones still have hydrogen, but it's just uh, the consequence of it's sort of like a chemical environment, and those hydrogen is you know, compacted by you know, all kinds of other metal ions, magnesium, and calcium, and minerals, that leads to a really short T2. T2 yeah. Is, yeah, so you have really, really short T2s for these kinds of tissues, so they just don't generate MR signal that we can detect. Um, there's people working on that, like bone imaging with MR, but it's very much on research. So, pretty much all all online systems are doing that. Yeah, all, yeah I, I, I won't say all because there's research systems that operate slightly differently, but all clinical systems. Frequency is the same for all hydrogen. We'll learn a little bit about that. It's a little bit different, like for hydrogen and fat, as opposed to hydrogen and water, but within a few parts per million. 
Alrighty, guys. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll try to take breaks like that. I know it's nice to not have to listen to me like the whole time. It'll depend a little bit on how much material we have to get through and so forth. And then uh, you guys always have things to chat about. There's usually some questions kind of in between as well. So use the breaks to take a break. Use the breaks to ask me questions. Uh, use the break to close your eyes. Uh, but here we go. So the last thing we'll talk about today, uh, everything else is sort of preface, right? Uh, I want to get into the physics of how we generate and build these B0 uh, fields uh, themselves, uh, the so-called main field, if you will. Uh, so where are we in this diagram? Well, right now we're really just talking about the generation of the B0 field. When we come back on, uh, for Wednesday's lecture, we'll learn more about how the B0 field uh, has its effect of generating so-called uh, magnetic moments that ultimately become detectable to us through their apparent bulk magnetization. Uh, water molecules, hydrogen nuclei in water molecules, behave like little tiny magnetic dipoles, little tiny itty bitty magnets. And that's what gives us our ability to uh, sense and detect them in the first place. But to do so, those hydrogen nuclei need to be in the presence of a, of a B0 field. And for a variety of reasons, some of which we'll talk about uh, today, some of which we'll cover more on Wednesday, high magnetic fields give us a lot of polarization of our signal. So to first order, higher and higher fields are better and better for MR imaging. That's certainly true as you approach kind of the many Tesla fields or, or the low Tesla fields, one and a half Tesla, three Tesla. These get a little bit more complicated when you start talking about imaging systems that are seven Tesla systems or 11 Tesla systems. Those are very much research only systems right now. And there are some other complicating factors that uh, limit their uh, wide applicability at this point in time. All right, so how do we generate a B0 field? Well, the main thing we need is a solenoid, right? So hopefully you've taken a physics course before that's covered some of this, but I'll go through a little bit of it uh, right now about generating solenoid fields by running currents through wires, right? So on the left-hand side, we have uh, the right-hand rule for a current flowing through a wire. So if we have current just coursing through a straight copper wire, we'll generate a, a circular magnetic field following the so-called right-hand rule, thumb pointing along the direction of current flow. Uh, we'll generate a, a magnetic field around that wire. Now, we can bend that wire, of course, into a variety of different shapes. If we bend it into a coil or a helix, we can, uh, we can cause uh, magnetic field lines to sort of superpose. So the magnetic field from this part of the wire over here is superposing, it's adding up with the magnetic field from wire on the other side. The consequence of which is you get a high magnetic field density in the middle of your solenoid. And that means by running current through this wire, through a certain number of turns of wire, certain uh, geometries and different uh, kinds of wires, we can generate different magnetic field densities or magnetic field line densities, which give us stronger and stronger, for example, magnetic fields. This really arises principally from Ampere's law, where we see that if we integrate the B field along the length of the wire, that's uh, the B field that we get, if you will, is related to the, uh, the permeability uh, of free space or whatever material you have filling your solenoid and the underlying current. Now, Ampere's law is a, is a very sort of uh, uh, straightforward, uh, rather not a straightforward way to get at sort of what's the, the total magnetic field generated by a solenoid but it gives rise to some relatively straightforwards of understanding the magnetic fields generated by solenoids. And so here's a very simple relationship that just says that to uh, first order approximation, if you will, uh, the magnetic field, the B field that we can generate is equal to the permeability. So we have to know the permeability uh, of the substance inside of our solenoid. Now, if you're building an electromagnet, you may not fill it with air because that may not be the most useful thing for you. We need to fill it with air because we're going to be introducing a body, of course, into the middle of our solenoid. And so we take the permeability to be that of uh, either free space, uh, which is a vacuum, or of air, which is really just barely, uh, barely different than that. Uh, so we know what that is. It's a constant. Uh, it's a pretty small number, but nevertheless, it's a constant. And if we want to know the magnetic field that we can generate with a solenoid that's filled with air, we have to... Uh, we have to de de uh, design for ourselves, if you will, what's the number of turns, so how many windings of coil do we actually have, and what's the overall length of the coil. This ends up relating to something like the current density, right? So if we have a lot of windings over a short length and we run a high current through it, we can generate large magnetic fields. And that's effectively what we need to be able to do to generate a high magnetic field for an MR scanner. Now we're going to talk about 
why this is a non-trivial exercise shortly, uh, but this is effectively what we need to be able to do. Uh, by way of sort of getting you more familiar with uh, MATLAB again, if you aren't already, uh, we can pull off the shroud on our scanner, and it's nice, the engineers have written down for us the current. <laughs> Right, so we can see that our MR system here, this is just looking at the outside of the scan or sort of just behind the shroud on the scanner. We can see that our uh, one and a half Tesla system is coursing with about 510 amps. Uh, if you're not coming from an electrical engineering background or a circuits background, that is a lot of amperage, right? That's a huge amount of current that will melt most uh, traditional materials. And we'll come back to talking about that in a second. Uh, if we use this current, uh, and we use the permeability of free space, uh, and we use 235 turns of superconducting wire over a length of about a meter, so good rough numbers for how we would build a MR uh, scanner, then we can generate a magnetic field of one and a half Tesla. So we can sort of reverse engineer or guess a little bit that they need about 235 windings of, of, of superconducting wire over about a, a meter's length to generate this magnetic field. It's not really quite right, but it's a good first approximation to look at. Uh, so this gives us a sense immediately that we need huge currents or very large numbers of windings. Uh, and in fact, what really matters is the overall current density. And as a consequence of not being able to do this with traditional materials like copper, we have to rely on superconducting materials, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, we can also look pretty quickly at the uniformity of our B field. So this is the, the, the B field is a vector field, right? So we can look at the Z component of our B field along the Z direction. So how does the magnetic field that points, you know, if you will, along the Z direction, how does it change along the axis of a solenoid? Well, there's some closed form solutions for this when, this, you know, when the circumstances are relatively simple and somewhat perfect that just depend on things like the radius of the solenoid and the length of the solenoid. And it turns out that BZ uh, is only uniform when the length is much, much longer than the radius. Okay, now not terribly surprising, but what that means is that you have to, in principle, if you want a uniform magnetic field, and we'll learn more about why this is so important later, but we need magnetic fields that are accurate to within like parts per million. <coughs> so when I say it's a one and a half Tesla field, I mean it's one and a half Tesla plus or minus a micro Tesla. Right? So these are very precisely engineered magnetic fields. Now, unfortunately, to get a really uniform BZ field, I need to have L much longer than R. What's wrong with that as an engineering constraint? What's, the, what's a good number for the radius of my scanner? To something. Something. Three feet. Three feet, perfect. Okay, so three foot radius is called a meter, right? Probably on the big side for the, for the radius, probably good for the diameter, but a meter. So that means that the length of my scanner has to be much more than a meter. What's much more? Is 10 much more? Well, barely, right? Is 100 much more? Yeah, okay. So that says that under these really, you know, sort of uh, simplistic solenoid engineering designs, we need to have a length to radius ratio of 100 to 1. We're going to have an MR scanner that's 100 meters long. Like, that's not going to happen, right? So there has to be a lot more that goes into the engineering of these systems so that they become high, highly uniform magnetic fields over very short lengths. And the consequence is that you just have to design the current density in such a way that you can achieve that goal. We're, we won't get into the details of that, but this just points out uh, uh, using the same expression. Here's some more MATLAB code for how we can uh, evaluate this. This MATLAB code will generate the plot that's shown on the right-hand side. So again, a good exercise if you're not familiar with MATLAB yet. Plug in some constants about permeability, about currents and different lengths of scanners from two meter long scanner to a 10 meter long scanner using the same number of turns, the same, uh, here I used a radius of a meter. So that's, that's actually not a great number, but uh, it was in fact the one that was uh, called out maybe because of this. Uh, bottom line, uh, we can loop through just some different design considerations and see that if we have a really short scanner, so this would be a scanner that's only two meters long, we can't even really achieve the magnetic field strength that we would expect based on the very simple uh, B field equation we had a few slides ago. Uh, as we go up to having a length to radius uh, ratio of 10, so a very long scanner relative to uh, its radius, we get close to the B field that we want, and it's, you know, it's relatively uniform, but of course it falls off as you get out to the edges. So two points here. The scanners themselves are of course designed to have very uniform fields over very short distances while themselves being short. 
and that requires something a little bit more sophisticated than a simple solenoid, fine. Uh, and then secondly, this is some MATLAB code that uh, you could use to begin getting more familiar with using MATLAB uh, in ways that'll be uh, useful for the course. And that code is online as well. So I said it before, but we're gonna be coursing really huge currents uh, through these solenoids or these so-called solenoids uh, so that we can generate the magnetic field strengths that we care about. Uh, but if we were to run 500 amps through copper wire, we would have a, a pool of molten copper. Uh, so not, uh, not very useful in that sense. Consequently, we rely heavily on superconductivity. Uh, these guys, uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schreifer, uh, were given a 1972 Nobel Prize in physics for their jointly developed theory of superconductivity. Uh, so some really smart guys had really uh, discovered and then uh, opened up an entire field here uh, of both physics and then uh, became, uh, became to have several and many applications later, MR being, uh, of course, one of them. And it's a really uh, strange uh, situation. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about superconductivity in just a second. And this is just really supporting what I said before, that copper wire can support maybe 10 amps, something like that, if the diameter of the wire is about three millimeters in diameter. It would require massive cooling, right? So if, if the 10 amps didn't melt, or, you know, we, we know we need to put through even 100 amps, but if the copper wire didn't melt, it would certainly generate a huge amount of heating, which would have to be dissipated so we don't cook the subject or the patient or whatever else is there, right? And that would also require constant energy input to maintain the field. So so-called resistive electromagnets are totally impractical for MR. If you want to generate, you know, millitesla fields or something like that, you can get away with it. It's probably cost effective. But as soon as you want to go to the, you know, the Tesla field strengths, you have to be superconducting. It's the only thing that's going to work. So superconducting wire can support hundreds of amps, right? So very, very high currents. Uh, if you will, and it's not just great. <laughs> I can see it here. Okay, hang on. I think they're doing something on the back end. Sorry, guys. There, it should come on. Yep, okay. <clears throat> so obviously superconductive wires said it three or four times, right? We can support really high currents through these uh, wires. Uh, there's no resistive heating because it's superconducting. There's no resistance, not just like kind of close to zero, but there's zero resistance, right? So we don't heat up the system uh, by this current coursing through it. And not only that, but the current is sort of stored in the superconducting wire and it continuously flows through the wire in this sort of remarkable way, right? But that means it doesn't require any, any energy input with once it's ramped up. So we can inject current into superconducting wire. It will circulate through superconducting wire till the end of time, more or less, uh, all the while maintaining a V0 field, right? So it's really, uh, ultimately, a uh, really remarkable thing uh, and exceptionally useful for building an MR scanner. Uh, if you look at what this looks like uh, uh, in, in, in practice or in theory, uh, the electrical resistance uh, row, it drops abruptly to zero, not kind of close to maybe zero, but like to zero when the material is cooled below its critical temperature. This is the principle of superconductivity. And so you're able to maintain a really large current with no applied voltage. So we talk about TC, the critical temperature. We'll talk about a B field, a critical B field as well in just a second. But as you cool things down and down and down to T critical, then suddenly right at T critical, you drop to zero resistivity. And this is this remarkable superconductivity uh, sort of feature, if you will. Lots of different ways to sort of build these systems. Ultimately, you need to have some kind of cryogen. Uh, the two most common cryogens would be liquid nitrogen, but that's, it's uh, liquid nitrogen is about 77 Kelvin. The next option is liquid helium, which is 4.2 Kelvin. Liquid helium is what we end up having to use because all of these superconducting materials have T criticals that are well below the liquid nitrogen uh, freezing, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, right? So we can't operate in the superconductivity range under liquid nitrogen temperatures. There's a so-called interest in uh, high temperature superconductors, right? If you could invent, design, and, and produce a high temperature superconductor, 
that can operate under liquid nitrogen temperatures, you'd have an even more widely accessible uh, material for superconductivity, uh, which would have other applications and cost implications and all kinds of things. Uh, we'll talk about helium in just a second because it's a, it's a scarce and ever uh, increasingly scarce resource. Uh, so bottom line, superconductive materials are lots of different materials are available. The MR systems use niobium tin. Uh, that's the most widely used. The Large Hadron Collider, which also uses superconducting mag magnets, uses niobium uh, titanium. Uh, and there's, of course, this interest in high temperature superconductors for, for a bunch of different reasons, but we're just not quite there uh, yet. <clears throat> Here we can see this. Uh, not just the, the critical temperature coming into play, but also the B field, the critical B field coming into play. So if we build a system uh, like an MR system using uh, niobium tin down here, then the T critical is 18 degrees Kelvin. So we have to be below 18 Kelvin to keep it superconducting, uh, generally speaking. Uh, we also can only support B fields up to about 24 and a half Tesla. So uh, above 24 and a half Tesla where you'll lose superconductivity. Now, in, in reality, we actually operate in these kind of mixed states. And so you have the states of like pure superconductivity and, and these so-called mixed states. And we won't get into a lot of details of what, what that really means, uh, but there's basically an envelope uh, under which you need to be. You have to be below the B critical and you have to be below the T critical or, or below the sort of envelope, if you will, to maintain this so-called mixed state and therefore uh, be able to support superconducting currents, okay? Different uh, materials will have different envelopes, and this has been mapped out here for uh, niobium tin, uh, for example. There's also critical currents, so you can, if you try to put too much current through something, uh, you'll also lose so-called superconductivity. Really remarkable uh, materials. The way they're sort of built and constructed really relies on really tiny filaments, like 20 microns thick of, say, niobium uh, titanium. And it's, they need to be small because the current in superconductivity, the current only flows on the skin or on the surface. It's not flowing through like the core of these elements themselves. So what you really want is a large amount of surface area if you're gonna generate large amounts of current. And then those tiny filaments are then embedded in copper and the copper also uh, enables additional uh, um, mechanical stability, but also low resistance paths for these really large currents that are flowing on the skins of these superconducting uh, filaments, if you will. And so you can see just an example here of hundreds of superconducting wires twisted into an individual one millimeter cable that might get embedded in copper and embedded in these other matrix elements so that it becomes sort of a workable material for building, uh, say, an MR system itself. Uh, these are just different examples of the same different superconducting uh, wires that are wound up from those little tiny filaments, if you will, in the so-called cable and conduit conductors. We'll have a bunch of these cable and conduit conductors that are wound around the outside of our scanner and wound around in a pattern such that we get that really high B field that's very, very uniform in the middle of our system. We don't really care what the B field is in, in other places. We just care what it's, uh, uh, how well formed it is in the middle of our MR system, if you will. Okay, so let's look at some, some sort of cutaways of the B0 uh, sort of hardware itself, if you will. Uh, this would be a classic sort of diagram of a superconducting electromagnet. So all modern MR imaging systems are superconducting electromagnets. Uh, resistive magnets won't do, uh, and permanent magnets are too low field to be of use. So here you can see with the patient lying inside the scanner, this is just a cutaway of the superconducting block that's coursing that 500 amp current, if you will, uh, to support that one and a half Tesla field or whatever. Uh, so that. If we look uh, at another cross-section of the scanner, it would look something like this. We'll have a liquid helium bath that's keeping everything inside these uh, cable and conduit conductors nice and cold below their T-critical, if you will. We can have a large current flowing through, and we'll be able to generate this high magnetic field. Uh, internal to this B0 field component, if you will, will be other hardware components that we'll talk about as we go. Things like the gradients, uh, the body coil, the shim coils, all these other sort of hardware components that are required for exciting the spins, spatially localizing the spins, manipulating the contrast, uh, and, and sort of perfecting our magnetic field uh, itself. Uh, one more just sort of cutaway in the other direction here. Obviously, the patient slides down the central uh, sort of bore here. The anatomy of interest, whether it's their head or their knee or their neck, is put to the middle, what we call the isocenter of the scanner. Uh, and then, of course, surrounding them is this sort of terrifying uh, four Kelvin 
uh, helium vessel, right? Uh, and inside of that is all the superconducting wire and fiber and amps of current that looks really sort of nice and benign uh, in a stable configuration, but I'll show you some pictures a little bit later of what these systems look like when things don't go so well. Uh, other components here that are somewhat important are the what's called the cold head. The cold head is uh, what recompresses cryogen. So the cryogen will slowly heat up a tiny bit because there's, it's obviously a some exposure to the outside world, uh, even if it's inside vacuum chambers and so forth. The cold head will, uh, will collect the gas or the, or the cryogen that boils off, recompress it and re-inject it back into the scanner. So in the best case, you have so-called zero boil off MR systems, meaning they're internally uh, 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 sort of uh, sealed such that the cryogen, the liquid helium, doesn't boil off in a way. Uh, and that's important for several reasons, one of which is cost considerations. Um, obviously, scanners come in lots of different configurations. The ones that we'll use in this class for the labs are very typical clinical MR systems, uh, solenoids that you sort of lie in and slide into flat. We have here at UCLA uh, a high bore, uh, sorry, a small bore high field 7T scanner that gets used for preclinical research. There are systems that use 21 Tesla fields that are combined, permanent magnet, uh, uh, superconducting electromagnet systems, uh, and there are so-called low field open MR systems. These are uh, you know, typically not very good imaging systems, but because, uh, because they are so open, uh, that, tends to be, that tends to accommodate patients that aren't otherwise uh, comfortable going into sort of the narrower confines of a traditional clinical scanner, if you will. Uh, this is just a nice picture of the cold head that's at the top of the, uh, sort of sits on top of the scanner and recondenses the helium vapor and returns that liquid helium uh, to the cryogen vessel itself uh, or, or to a storage uh, tank and then it gets re-injected later. Uh, and you'll hear this thing when you walk into uh, an MR room, you always hear the sort of chirping away of some pump. It goes, and if you don't hear that noise, you walk into the MR room, it's, it's usually from someone like me, it's alarming because it means the cold head's not running. Uh, we could be boiling off cryogen, our system may quench. And we'll talk about quenches in just a second. So it's very comforting for me to hear the cold head running when I walk into the MR suite. Uh, there's also a helium fill port. So of course the helium does boil off in some systems uh, at, at slow rates and you may have to uh, put helium back in or in the case that you have a so-called quench, meaning there was a catastrophic loss of field and a catastrophic loss of cryogen, you may be able to recover your system, bring it back up or bring it back down to superconducting temperatures by refilling with helium and re-injecting current and getting off and on your way. Uh, sort of interesting to think about, where does all this helium come from, right? Uh, so we need a lot of helium, we need thousands and thousands of liters of helium uh, to, uh, to fill one of our MR system. It's typically extracted from natural gas. It's stored in our strategic helium reserve. So back in World War II times, the US government saw to storing a lot of helium in a, in a strategic reserve. Uh, the interesting thing is that helium that escapes the atmosphere is lost forever, right? So right now it's trapped in different things because of you know the big bang a while ago, right? And as we're, as we're getting it out of those stored systems and it's released into our atmosphere, it's very, very light and it just goes off into space and beyond, right? So our ability to recover helium once it's lost the atmosphere is zero, right? So it is a really finite resource and it hasn't really come to be uh, a specific problem at this point in time, but you can imagine just like with other rare uh, and unusual resources, non-renewable resources, that we may have a problem with helium at some point. It would be nice if we could build nitrogen-based systems because nitrogen is very abundant in our atmosphere, very easy to reclaim, very easy to sort of work with, uh, but we don't yet have superconducting materials that work at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Um, I talked about this some already, but these so-called zero boil-off designs, of course, are really appealing for clinical centers or any center that's cost-conscientious because uh, you'd like to not have to uh, pour helium into your system at the rate of you know, hundreds or even a thousand liters per year. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but something that's really important is the B0 uh, homogeneity. Now, MR, for some reason, refers to more commonly as the inhomogeneity rather than the heterogeneity, but we won't get trapped in the semantics of it all. But we really want our MR fields to be very precise uh, and, and uniform spatially. Uh, and how precise do I want them to be? Well, well, we'll learn later why this is really the case, but we need them to be precise within something like micro Tesla. So if we're generating and using one and a half Tesla, three Tesla fields 
we want the spatial variation in that field to be on the scale of micro Tesla, which is uh, obviously quite small uh, and requires high engineering standards to build these systems. Magnets, of course, aren't perfect. The B0 field in homogeneity induces, unfortunately, image and phase artifacts. So that'll become more obvious as we sort of get further into the class, but it'll cause things like image distortions and image shifts and bad SNR and off resonance problems. So we need these magnetic fields to be very spatially homogeneous. Uh, we can improve the B0 homogeneity in basically two different ways. We have so-called passive shimming, where we can place ferromagnetic uh, shims inside the scanner itself and shape the field. We can push the field lines around depending on uh, where and how much ferromagnetic mass we place inside the scanner. We can also use so-called active shimming. And active shimming just means we turn on some currents and some coils, some other solenoids that are inside the scanner. And by turning on and adjusting those currents, we can adjust the, the magnetic field that superposes with that B0 field. So there's sort of a passive way that we can do it and a very active way. Uh, in terms of measuring the B0 homogeneity, we won't talk about exactly how you measure B0. Uh, there's, there are imaging ways to do that. There are hardware ways to do that. You can have a B field probe, for example. But what we typically care about is what's the maximum B0 minus something like the minimum B0 divided by maybe the mean B0 over some region of interest or some volume of interest. And again, we need that to be on the, on the order of sort of parts per million or micro Tesla, if you will. So maybe a quarter part per million uh, for a 40 centimeter diameter spherical volume. And we can accommodate maybe a little bit more than that, one part per million over 50 centimeters diameter spherical volume. So we always think of imaging at isocenter, the isocenter being sort of the, the most uh, central sort of zero, zero, zero coordinate of the scanner. Uh, and so we care about the field homogeneity in and around isocenter. We don't really care if the field's really inhomogene inhomogeneous way out here at the edges, but don't actually perform any imaging way out uh, at the edges themselves. Um, if you take off the shroud, this is uh, during the installation of one of our scanners here at UCLA, uh, in fact, in this building. Uh, what you'll see, so this big tank here, this is the cryogen tank that stores all the superconducting wire and the cryogen shield and uh, uh, the liquid helium and so forth. And just inside, uh, sort of rather just outside of that, but uh, more close to the isocenter is this hardware element here. And this is a, this is a variety of different hardware components stacked into a a single cylinder that can slide in and out of the scanner if it needed to be replaced. And it's basically the B1 coil for exciting, it's the gradient coils, it's the shim coils. And what I'm showing you here is actually the shim, the so-called passive shim trays. So at, at each uh, position, right, you know, call this, I don't know, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. At each of these positions, there's this tray that slots in and out of the system. Now, you can only slot that tray in and out of the system when the field is ramped down because you're going to be putting in ferromagnetic material that will help you shape the field. Each of those trays that you can slide in and out can accommodate a shim deck or a bunch of different uh, shims of different size. So this is a shim. This is a slot in that tray that's empty. This is a large shim card. This is a small shim card. And this is when the, when the shim deck is sealed. And I can slide this whole thing in and out of the scanner and consequently shape my field. Now, the engineers, when they install the system, they'll put a magnetic field monitoring probe inside the system. They will add current into the magnetic field, uh, bring the field up to strength. Uh, they will map the field with this magnetic field mapper. And then they will check to see if their RMS is less than, say, a parts per million. If it's not, then they have to ramp down the field, take all the current away from the magnetic field. They need to adjust those shim trays based on magnetic field simulations, take some shims out, add some shims in, adjust the shims, ramp it back up, map the field until they reach their acceptable criteria, whatever that specification is for installing at that particular site. Uh, I kind of talked through these things uh, already. Uh, the other way to do it is the so-called active uh, shim coil. So you can add small amounts of current to, uh, to tune the shim. Think of them just as other solenoids or other coil windings. Uh, by adding small amounts of current, we can shape the field uh, as well. And that'll give us some additional compensation. The passive shims were kind of for uh, location-specific effects. Uh, the fact that your scanner is sited in a very specific location, uh, it has other ferromagnetic structures that are part of a larger building or something like that. It needs to be shimmed for its environment. 
the active shims are more used for making small adjustments once someone has been placed in the scanner or once the object of interest is placed in the scanner so that we can accommodate you know coil effects or patient effects and really make our field as homogeneous as possible if you will uh, and the combination of both passive and active shimming results in a still imperfect magnetic field, but it gets us into that sort of parts per million range, uh, which is acceptable, uh, generally speaking. Uh, when we just look quickly at how these uh, z-axis uh, active shims could work, uh, again, remember, at the let's say this is the long axis of my scanner, the bore. Uh, I could have coil windings, say, at the head direction. I had coil windings at the foot direction. I can run some electrical current through these windings, and these are just small solenoids. I'll generate B fields that add with my uh, local B0 field or maybe superpose, uh, or sorry, work against uh, my local B0 field. And consequently, I can adjust that B0 field just uh, like uh, the fields uh, uh, is generated with a normal solenoid, for example. Uh, so what does that do? Well, here's an extreme example. We can see that the B0 field at the foot is B0 plus some delta B0, maybe closer to isocenter, it really does uh, land right on B0, and maybe closer to the head is B0 minus B0. What I'm going to do is run some current through these two coils to even out the magnetic field so that everything is close to B0. My magnetic fields are pointing in the same direction of the same magnitude, and I should, in this case, have uh, sort of perfect field homogeneity. Uh, again, we never quite get perfect, but we can get it down to parts per million for sure. Uh, okay, a couple kind of fun and exciting things here. Let's talk about quenching and ramping the field, and then we'll cover one or two more things and, uh, and let you guys go. Uh, quenching the field is really only going to be performed under life-threatening circumstances. So if you walk into an MR scanner room, you will see a quench button here. This, this button lets us do a variety of things. We can shut down the hardware, computers, gradients, electrical componentry of the system. But we can also pull up this clear tab here. We can punch the red button and it will quench the magnetic field, dropping it from one and a half Tesla to, you know, to Earth's field uh, in seconds very, very quickly. Uh, that leads to sort of the explosive boil off of hundreds of liters of liquid helium. And so uh, there's a cryogen vent, large bore, 10 centimeters, maybe 15 centimeters at the top of the scanner. And that exits out uh, through a cryogen vent that goes to the outside of the building. And if you were standing on the outside of the building when there was a quench, you would see a huge plume like this and say, that doesn't look good. Um, you'll have a total loss of superconductivity. That's a positive feedback cycle. We'll, we'll, we'll see about this in just a second. Uh, a huge energy dissipation, right? It's lots of megajoules of energy that are stored in that system. In fact, superconducting magnets are being looked at as ways of storing energy uh, as, you, as you would need for uh, if you're generating energy for the community. Uh, there'll be a loud bang, there might be electrical arcing, and then of course this cryogen bolt, uh, boil off. There can be some safety hazards associated with quenching. Uh, let's watch a quench video to talk about some of those, and then we'll come back to uh, uh, a couple of the safety things too. I'm hoping you can hear this well. Looks like you can't. <laughs> Awesome. Mess around with this for too long. Nice. All right, not so much for that. I think they're having some problems with this. This screen here has been doing a variety of different things. Okay, not critical. Basically what this was going to show you was the actual cryogen boil off and when they get to uh, this phase here, 
you can see here they're doing a test sequence of actually testing uh, the quench uh, function of a magnet that they're about to deploy. Uh, so quenching can be done without damaging, significantly damaging the hardware itself, but uh, 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 only if those circumstances can be more controlled than might happen if the, if the system is unattended when it quenches, for example. And here you're just getting that large boil off of cryogen, right? So that's liquid helium that these guys, <laughs> this guy in particular, doesn't seem too worried about. Uh, filling up his room and suffocating him. Uh, but that is a very real problem. Uh, but they seem to be pretty comfortable with the whole situation. Uh, so uh, cryogen gases are, are, are a known sort of hazard or risk associated with MR systems, right? Uh, anytime they boil off, they will potentially fill up rooms. It should all go out the cryogen vents, but sometimes it happens that the cryogen vent gets blocked and they don't get used that often. Somehow it's blocked by some other construction process or something else that's happened inadvertently, uh, and it could quench into the room. Uh, the rooms are made so the doors blow out, these kinds of things, but, uh, and there are oxygen sensors in place as well, but it's still always uh, a possible uh, problem. So definitely something to be aware of in the, in the circumstances of a quench. If the people around you are passing out, grab them and leave the room. Uh, okay. Uh, at the same time, during that cryogen vent, you'll, you'll uh, obviously be, you'll have a lot of very, very cold uh, cryogen boiling off. That will leave a lot of the conducting metal structures that just sort of make the outside of the scanner very, very, very cold. Uh, you could end up in a situation where these things, these very, very cold surfaces were exposed and could lead to some problem if you were sort of mucking around. So something to be conscientious of, but uh, not really a, 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 not a, a hazard you're likely to face. Um, so what's the cost of a quench? We obviously don't want to do this on purpose. I said before, the main magnetic field is always on, right? We don't turn the system on and off. Uh, in order of sort of probably cost, the, the, the worst thing would be that you may have to replace your hardware if it was damaged. And that can certainly happen. There can be cracks to the superconducting wires, or the cryogen case or whatever, and then the magnet itself is, is gone. You may be able to keep some of the other hardware componentry, but that's one of the most expensive components. The liquid helium itself, thousand, you know, thousand liters, two thousand liters, is going to cost you ten, twenty thousand dollars to uh, refill, and of course that helium is lost to the outer space forever. Um, you're going to have downtime, and downtime is costly, right? You could be running this scanner at five hundred dollars an hour, or whatever it is, recouping your costs and keeping your your uh, your center imaging center in the black, but that may not happen. Uh, will you won't be imaging when you've quenched? Uh, you'll need engineers' time to bring the system back online. You're paying for these service contracts to do it. Uh, and least of all is actually the cost of the electricity to ramp the field. It's not that expensive to ramp up these fields, even though it's still a, a quite a bit of energy that goes into uh, ramping up the field itself. Um, when it comes to ramping up the field, either at the time of commissioning the system or at the time of bringing it back up from a quench, there's a few steps that are required. Really what it requires is hooking up a power supply to pump current uh, such that you can energize the field. Uh, to do so, of course, requires some resistive wires. You have to have some resistive power supply on the outside world, and it has to connect and attach to your superconducting coil inside your scanner. Uh, and the way that's done is this power supply is connected to windings on the cryostat. Uh, there's a little heated resistance uh, that's going to form there. That's okay as long as it's not too warm for too long, which would then lead to another quench. So I guess the first step is you have to bring your system back down to superconducting temperatures, and then you're trying to inject current while keeping it below T-critical, right? You don't want to quench it while you're trying to get the system up again. Eventually, you'll short circuit the main winding with superconductor uh, to form a persistent switch. So wherever you're injecting the current, eventually you need this resistive path to go back to superconducting temperatures uh, so that it uh, so that the current flows appropriately and doesn't hit a resistive path that causes it to uh, eventually boil off uh, or, or uh, lose superconductivity. You just turn off your power supply and now the magnet's going to be in so-called persistent mode. And this is this really remarkable thing that I talked about earlier, right? The current's injected into the system. It's flowing with zero resistance uh, through the superconducting wire and the B field is maintained. Uh, and it's pretty stable for months and months and months and months. So it will decay as some sort of RL circuit, if you will. There's some resistive inductive losses in this whole thing, but it's going to decay, you know, I don't know. I don't actually know the real numbers, but my guess is it's not more than hundreds of micro Tesla per month or something like that. Uh, so they're very stable magnetic fields, if you will. And someone can always come in and say, oh, look, your 
you know, test the machine is actually 1.49. You can top it off with some currents and you'll be good to go again, right? Uh, this is just the power supply that they use. So you can see this big power supply gets rolled in. These big cables here uh, roll up to the scanner. They go in towards the top there, and they're injecting current into superconducting uh, coil windings. And they're doing, they're able to support currents here. You can see this is uh, up to 725 amps. So they can uh, uh, put in a significant amount of current to get these systems uh, up and going. Just a few more things to, to get through here in terms of MR rooms. Uh, and their construction. One of the things you have to do is keep your main magnetic field, your B0 field, from affecting other things in a hospital environment, right? You have a one and a half Tesla field. You don't want all ferromagnetic devices in the hospital drifting towards your MR scanner, right? And so one of the things we have to do is shield the room to reduce its magnetic field uh, footprint, if you will. That can reduce your install cost, meaning you can install it in a smaller space, and it will reduce interference of your device with the outside world, if you will. Uh, easily done with passive shielding. You have uh, iron that lines the room. We have literally, you know, quarter inch iron that lines most of our MR suites, if you will. Uh, that's heavy, uh, but it's rel and, and really not that cheap when you're talking about, you know, tons and tons of steel, quite literally. Uh, you can also have so-called active shielding. So there are uh, other coil windings in the system that can keep the field at the, at the middle of one and a half Tesla, but push down the field towards the edges of the scanner, if you will. And that can um, uh, help uh, uh, sort of reduce the footprint as well. Uh, when you look at really high field systems, this is a so-called unshielded 7T system that was installed up in Oregon. Uh, uh, this is maybe 10 years ago now. Uh, and here you can see the steel, it's about two to three feet thick that's lining this space to keep this 7T magnet from interfering with, you know, things that are outside of the, uh, you know, the design space here. So uh, a very significant part of the cost of the installation here was the, I forget how many tens of tons of steel were required, but it was uh, on par with the expense of the unit itself. Uh, really kind of uh, uh, surprising in some sense. Uh, the other direction that we have to worry about when we build a room is we, we're going to use radio frequency energy. We haven't talked about it too much yet, but we use radio frequency energy to excite the spins. There's radio frequency energy all over, right? Coursing through the room, the Wi-Fi signals and everything else, right? Uh, and we need to keep those radio frequency signals from the outside world from getting into our MR suite. So we want B0 to stay in our suite, but we don't want the RF to get into our suite. Uh, and so we have to just basically build a Faraday cage. So this is a nice picture of one of our MR installations. Uh, and you can see the copper cladding all around the room. Uh, that, that means that there's a conducting structure basically uh, encompassing or covering the MR scanner suite that keeps stray radio frequency energy from getting into our MR suite. The consequence of which it could, it could be picked up by your coil and interpreted as imaging information, and you would somehow you know, end up with noise or streaking artifacts or something in your MR image because of the stray radio frequency uh, energy. Uh, when we come back uh, on Wednesday, we'll talk much more about bulk magnetization and nuclear possession. That's in lecture two. Uh, depending on how sort of the digital recording worked here today, we'll get uh, as much or all of it as we can up on the web, uh, hopefully later today, but maybe first thing tomorrow. And already the slides and the code from today are posted online. If you have a hard time accessing it, can't access it, let me know right away. There's always some web things that we have to get sorted out. Uh, so let me know. And otherwise, I'll see you Wednesday. Uh, if you came in a little bit late, look at the very first couple slides, the two most critical things. There's a question for your final exam has already been shared. Uh, and we have lecture Friday. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you Wednesday, OK? Thanks.